Martin Luther King had a dream. And as I respond to the revelation of the Holy Spirit, there's a dream forming in my mind. And in that dream, I see a church completed. A church at this next phase, holding six to 800 people. And I see a choir loft that'll seat 100. And I see a piano that's called a concert grand. Not a baby grand, but a concert grand. How long are they? How many feet long? Nine or 12 foot long. I see an organ. And other things to come as God blesses. An orchestra. Violins. And a harp. <laughs> be nice to see Carol and Otis on that stage with good instruments. Carol has one, but Otis needs his instrument needs some improvement. That is, the sound system does, and that's coming. But uh, there's some wonderful things ahead for us. These years of of being faithful by God's grace are paying off. And uh, this community is one of the fastest growing in the state of West Virginia. The sewer lines are coming through, opens up new, uh, new possibilities for people moving in. As much as we maybe like to keep just the country area, it's not going to stay that way. It really isn't now. And the interstates uh, fan out even farther. And it's not going to be uncommon in the future for people to drive in from quite a distance. It's not uncommon now, is it? <laughs> Praise the Lord. But the wonderful thing about it is it's not a dream of flesh, but it is a dream of the Holy Spirit. God is in it, and we praise Him marvelously. I thank the Lord that Sunday was over $9,000 in offerings, and the year before we came, the total yearly income was $14,000. In one Sunday, $9,000. 1968, the budget here was $14,000. And uh, we owe it all to Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. And uh, I'm glad that God has privileged us to be together as a people. Brother Saladay, I trust as the waiting comes to Huntington, you'll be able to bring a few of those friends in that you've been talking to. There was a man here Sunday two ago. Dad met him at the back door. He said, I'm here because of the report of Jack Saladay. And I've enjoyed the service. Praise God. I want to give the thanks for the privilege of having Woody and Barbara and their family here with us tonight. We shared last Wednesday night the, the wonderful experience that Raymond and Nancy and, and Steve and Rod had. And uh, Woody, welcome to the services here, your precious family. And we pray that as we worship together, the Lord will bring us close together as a people and cause us to, to worship him in spirit and in truth and to walk with him along this way. The message we have to offer here is not one that's easy. And when Jesus first shared the message I've been trying to share for almost eight years, nearly everyone left him. In the sixth chapter of John, when he finally shared it to the multitudes, as long as they were having a hallelujah good time, and people were getting healed, and people were getting fed by the thousands, the crowds came. But just as soon as he made it clear what it was all about, nearly everyone left him but the disciples. My joy has been that in these last almost eight years, we have not shared, come on, folks, let's have a big circus. Oh, God's given us times of glory, times of blessedness. I don't know how it could be any better than it was here last Sunday. It was just so exciting to watch Edward have that benediction and blessing placed upon him and see him break and cry and hear the choir sing that wonderful cantata and hear the kids finish there were songs, some, I guess almost 70 by the night service, sing the songs they did to hear the 
glad songs of Zion and the testimony from the saints and to have the glory falling and to feel the fellowship and love of the Holy Spirit, I tell you, it's a great thing. But there, there comes a time when we walk out that door and we walk to furniture stores and kitchen cabinet places and factories and construction shops and more factories and accounting offices and banks and we sell insurance and real estate we wire homes and we perform secretarial work and it goes on and on and on somewhere along the way the cross gets heavy the self-denial is to go right on See, oh, I tell you, the following Jesus sometimes is in the grit and in the grind. But I'll tell you, it's not only the grit and the grind, but it's also the glory. For the way of the cross is a painful way, but it is also the way of glory. The way of pain is also the way of love. People need you. They need you to stay close to God. Though you have great need and I have great need, the folks that we rub shoulders with, they're hoping that you and I will be faithful. And they need a word of encouragement. Hell has enlarged their mouth and uh, it's raging all around us. Maybe you haven't been touched today by hell, but I've talked to folks that have been touched by hell. If you was broken hearted as they are tonight and they're in this building right now, you'd be mighty broken hearted. Sometimes it, it takes rubbing shoulders with death and with sin and with sickness to, have, to gain some measure of appreciation for what folks are going through. And really the truth is that none of us uh, escape the awful sin that was brought upon us when Adam sinned and when we agreed to cooperate as a people. But oh, thank God, in the middle of that, that uh, there's a resurrection of power available for us. The only thing is, it cannot be known unless we're willing to count all things as loss. Now, Paul said, unless we're willing to count all things as dung. That's the way the King James puts it. Some other books, some other translations as manure. Our job is secondary. Our home is secondary. Our church background is secondary. Our education is secondary. Our third, all that would ca cause us to uh, have some station and elevation. As far as me and our concern is abomination in the eyes of God. If it's first in our own eyes. Unless Jesus Christ is first in our own eyes. And then whatever is first is stenching in the nostrils of the Savior and is keeping us from walking with God. Oh, I pray tonight that we will not shirk from this and that we will respond to the, the message of the piano which says, Onward, Christian soldier, marching as to war. If you hadn't felt warfare this day, you haven't had your soldiering garments on. If you've not been in the battle this day, then you've, you've not been in the same world I'm living in. I'll tell you, though there's peace in my heart that the world cannot take away, there's a battle all around me raging as the devil in his last hour and last kick is trying to claim every life he can. In one sense, God loses the battle because only few are going to make it to heaven. Numerically, God's lost it. Not because he isn't big enough to take the devil. He can take the devil in any life that will let him. That's because men love darkness rather than light. But you can't choose darkness without choosing the consequences. The, the, when you choose for darkness and you choose to walk the way of the world, there are terrible consequences behind that. Even in this life, there's terrible consequence. The consequence of a broken home. The consequence of watching your children when they grow to the age of accountability choose against God rather than for God. 
I tell you, you can sow your wild oats and you can carry on and do what you want to. But my friends, if you've got children, those wild oats jump right down into those children. When they get up, they feel the rebellious spirit and they'll just do like mom and daddy and they'll go out here and have, do their own thing. I'm glad to, to say that for the most part, pleading the blood of Jesus, my children can look back on my life and see that daddy from a very small boy has longed to walk with God, has longed to do God's will, has tried to stay away from the devil. And when he went out and sinned a little bit, couldn't stay out there long, had to come back home. I wasn't at home out there. I wasn't at home until the blood of Jesus was uh, uh, splashed all over me and had taken out whatever uh, sin I had committed and so I could lie down at night and get on my pillow and say, Oh God, if you come before morning, I'm ready to go. Praise God and have the glory flood my soul like I was a great saint at seven and eight and nine years old simply because the blood of Jesus. I wasn't a great saint. But I felt like one. I felt the joy of the great saints of old. Because the blood of Jesus had washed away my sins. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know how to appreciate these songs. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. I'd sing those. Didn't know what they were saying. But it didn't make any difference when I asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins. He plunged me afresh in that fountain along with everybody else. I'm glad that we don't that Jesus doesn't go by knowledge. He goes by the heart, by the hunger right in here. And if a man is a is a down and trodden sinner and he needs help from God, he can call for help from God in the middle of the night and say, My God have mercy on me. Or in, at noonday or across the ocean or anywhere, and the God of glory will reach down through the Holy Spirit and and lift him up out of the miry clay till he can sing with the saints above. Uh, It is wonderful to walk this way. Praise God forevermore. That's just the introduction. I haven't got to the sermon. Praise the Lord. I don't know why folks want to live for the devil. It doesn't take a dumb man. It doesn't take a smart man to see that it's killing us. It doesn't take a smart man to see that it's going to tear us up to pieces. It doesn't take a smart man to see that hell's all around and something's happening to our souls. Lord, help us and have mercy on us. And our cry will be ever to be cleansed through the precious blood of Jesus and to be faithful to do His will. Such a small price to pay to walk this way. To hear the Savior say His yoke is easy, His burden is light. I found it so. I found it so. Sometimes when we think we're having a hard time as a Christian, we ought to remember what, that the way of the transgressor is hard, not the way of the Christian. We've got wonderful peace. That old song says, Peace, peace. Wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever I pray in fathomless pillows of There were two walking on the road to Emmaus one day. And they didn't have that peace. Let's read about them. It was found in Luke 24. One of the great resurrection stories. And I don't have but a little light burst, which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together in reason, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communication are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? Now the 16th verse says, But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. Have you ever thought about what Mark 16, 12 said? Read it. About this same incident. Just a little little comment, but very very revealing. Mark 16 and 12 tells us something that we may not have noticed before. 
speaking of this two, these two who were walking on the road to Emmaus, says, after that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. Well, that's, a, that's a mystery scripture if I ever saw one. But it says he appeared in another form. So, in some way, Jesus was disguised. And it says here, But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communication are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? Hast not known the things which are come to pass? There in these days, he said, are you the only one in Jerusalem that's not heard about these things? You know what that tells us? It tells us that nearly everybody in Jerusalem knew what was going on. He said, why, have you been in Jerusalem? Don't know anything about this? Notice how Mary talked at the tomb. You've taken my Lord away. How'd she know that man knew? See, everybody in Jerusalem knew what was going on. I tell you, you send a prophet to town, and about every mouth, about every mouth in the place is going to be buzzing. Especially when you do to this prophet what you did to Jesus. They knew about it, you see. And uh, so they were rather surprised. And it almost seems uh, rather startled. One of the translations says they stopped and asked him uh, these questions. Uh, how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. Years ago, when I preached on this passage, I took a hint from a, a, a mural that's painted in the church at Emmaus. And the, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a painting in my study uh, on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus is walking with two men. But in the mural that's in Emmaus, in the church of Emmaus, Jesus is walking with a man and a woman. And uh, some have speculated that inasmuch as this, the man here is a Cleopas, that it might have been uh, Jesus' uncle, Cleopas, who was married to his Aunt Mary. That this might be Aunt Mary and Uncle Cleopas as they walked to a man. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? Now, I, I, I lean uh, away from that today, but if that be true, listen to the conversation as they talk, Cleopas says, and word, Uncle Cleopas says in verse 19, and he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. Now Mary says, And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. Cleopas says, But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. Mary says, and besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Cleopas, yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. Cleopas again, when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. And then Aunt Mary says, and certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so, as the women had said, but him they saw not. Well, I don't know if it was Aunt Mary and Uncle Cleopas or not. I lean away from that theory today, even though that's plausible, I think. No, we don't know for sure. Because of some things which tell me that these were not so familiar with Jesus. Aunt Mary and Uncle Cleopas were more familiar than these folks were. And this is where that little light's a burning. Note that these men were not the inner core. Or man and woman or whatever. These persons were not of the inner core. If you read the story closely, you can see this is not the same. Now, there's something good for us here. I'll read the rest of the story. Then we'll go back with that thought. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. They drew nigh unto the village, whether they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us. 
for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he set at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. Now the thought is simply this. Although you can preach many things about this precious story. That these persons obviously were not of the inner core. The first reason that I think I see here is that they did not display the same strong personal affection for him as the disciples from Galilee. That's obvious, isn't it? Isn't it? In the context. There's not that strain, that same affection that Mary had for him. These men who are here. Reason number one. Reason number two. They mourn their loss of a messianic leader rather than their own beloved master. See, they're more concerned about their loss of a messianic leader rather than their own beloved master. Uh, Mary didn't say, Oh, Messiah. She said, Master. <laughs> you see, there's, oh, he was her Messiah. You know what? Uh, that tells me a little something today. Folks uh, are talking so much about the Messiah, but I like to hear them talk about their master. I like to hear them talk about their Lord and their master. And, and only a genuinely converted person talks that way. Jesus is in love with me, and I'm in love with Jesus. A man that's not really converted, not really, he may be as religious as all get out. But he's going to talk about Christ and Messiah at a distance. But he loves Jesus, friends. Oh, he'll proclaim that Jesus is the Messiah. But he'll say, oh, my Jesus. Oh, my Lord. My loving Lord. As Mary, Mary says, my living Lord. You remember how she'd say that. Mary Webster, the great saint of God. Thirdly, they did not share that quick insight which love imparts. If you look carefully through these verses, you'll notice their insight. It's not as quick as those who had been on the inner core and close around Jesus in those three years that he had his earthly ministry. Finally, they knew not that it was Jesus. Now listen to this, folks. Even when their hearts... We're burning. Friends, if they'd been around him very long in the inner core, wouldn't have long been long till they'll detected why that old heart was burning. Seems to me if they'd been very close around him on the Mount of Beatitudes, when he said, Blessed are the pure in heart. Oh. For they shall seek God. <laughs> Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. <laughs> I'll tell you, words from the living God would have burned within their hearts. It wouldn't have been a, wouldn't have been long till they would have been able to take when Jesus is passing by, hearts burn within us. The glory of God is made manifest. But they didn't know that. They were persons who had had their hope increase as a result of what they had heard and maybe only recently attached themselves to the uh, prophet band, to the apostolic band. But now there's something good about this. See, when Jesus appeared, he appeared 
most of, most of you can see appeared to those who knew him and loved him and who were near to him. Most of the appearances are that. But these folks were men who knew him from a distance. But he appeared to them anyway. Said, he said he noted that they were sad. Maybe we could title this The Drawing Power of Sadness. The drawing power of the mourning heart. The drawing power of the disappointed soul. The drawing power of the hungry heart. They weren't on the inner core. Maybe you feel a little left out at times because you're not the preacher or the head deacon or on the board. Maybe you've been on the fringes as far as a certain A, certain inner group is concerned. With Jesus, all are inner. They're all the inner core. But you get the feeling that way. You're going through a rough spell. It just seems like if, if you be, could be as close to God as the inner core, you could get a little more help. But folks, I want to tell you something here. There's something here that tells us about the drawing power of hunger and of sadness that the Savior doesn't overlook. These folks were walking on the margin as far as the inner core of the disciples were concerned. But Jesus, for the moment, is not in Jerusalem. He's not talking to Peter, and he's not talking to Mary. He's talking to Cleopas and his companion on their way to Emmaus. There's something very encouraging about that here. There's something so needful about this tonight. Something so very necessary when we feel a little left out. It's a puzzle to me why this man, Cleopas and his companion, left when they'd already heard that he was risen and left on the third day. Instead of running around Jerusalem trying to find where he was, they're going away disappointed. And they're talking about this disappointment, walking down the road. And I'll tell you, Jesus... Somewhere the angel in a cloud of glory or the heavenly father said, Now, Jesus, there's two fellows that are about as broken hearted and disappointed on their way from Jerusalem to Emmaus. I want you to go down there and talk to them. And Jesus slips up beside them. How many times has he slipped up beside us in our sadness, in our disappointment, and our eyes were holding and we didn't know he was near? Whew, boy, that helps me. Walking along a motley crew. <laughs> Disappointed and downhearted. And we're, and we're uh, you know, we, there's, there's this companionship of misery. Our hopes are gone. Our disappointments are down. And we run up the old white flag of surrender. We're saying to each other, it ain't much use. We had our hopes up, but they're gone now. All the while, Jesus is walking quietly nearby. Humble men, and obscure enough they may have been. But he was now to give them his time as freely as once he had given it to John and Andrew. Who can tell what power their sadness had in drawing the man of sorrows to their side. It's about as little lessons maybe I've ever given, but it's about as deep as I've ever put to you. It's about time we recognize what's happening when our hearts are burning within us. It's about time that we recognize the man of sorrows understands and draws near, near to us in our mourning. It's about time we remember his promise when he said, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's what he said. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. It's about time we recognize that he is able to give us all that we need. 
And that really he's very near. If our eyes could but lose our scales. But you know what he said to them? Oh fools. You have such a hard hearts. I tell you dear ones. It takes God to move beside us and shake us up a bit. Recognize that he has written in his holy word and his promises are always true. That God causes all things to work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. You can go over promise after promise after promise and they're all true. It won't be long till life on earth is over. It's fastly slipping from me. The banker and I were talking the other day when we were trying to make the home loan. And I said, you know, John, the last 20 years have gone awful fast. John's not too much older than me. And John said, Pastor, they tell me the t- next 20 goes faster. And friends, if Jesus tearing, and if I live, the next 20 is going to go faster than the first 20. It's time for me to get my eyes open. It's time for me to be today what I want to be 10 years from now. 10 years ago, I wanted to be something. I thought maybe it'd take about 10 years to get there. Well, I'm here. And I think maybe in 10 more years, I might make it. But God wants me to be now what I'd like to be 10 years from now. Faithful in trust. Faithful in revelation. Faithful in all things obedient. Faithful in love. Faithful in the little things. Just being his child for the day. Walking with him. Knowing that he is near. And recognizing when the kingdom of God is in operation. Did not our hearts burn with it? Well, they never forgot it after that. They might have been walking that old road to Emmaus. Can you see them years afterwards? Walking that same old road. And the companion says unto Cleopas, Cleopas, you remember the time we walked this road? And our hearts were burning in us over that stranger who was expounding the scriptures and telling us things about to take our breath. Boy, wasn't that an experience? Oh, how wonderful it was when we recognized who he was. In the breaking of bread. Well, that's where the little light was burning. I said, Jesus, it's little, but that's where the light's burning. Oh, my. Why should I be discouraged? Why should I doubt or fear? When my Savior is near. Just remember. In true mourning. And in true sadness. There is a power. That draws the Son of God near to us. He loves us. He cares for us. He understands and he satisfies. Let us pray. Father we thank thee. For this new insight in an old story, The Road to Emmaus. We thank you for these that have gathered here tonight. Lord, I got so happy in the last ten minutes, I didn't hardly know what to do. I I felt like if I hadn't frightened somebody, I could have run and hollered and shouted. Like sister was shouting, our dear sister in Jesus, whom we've never, this is the second time we've ever seen her. Oh, what fellowship we've had tonight. Look down while we're singing, there is not a friend like Jesus. Oh, Jesus, I could tell she knew what the song was all about. Thank you, Father, for being so patient, so kind and true through thy dear son that we can be comforted in our sorrow, be encouraged in our sadness, and know that no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Heal the broken heart tonight. 
Deliver us from blindness that we may see that thou art near and that thou art more than willing to help us if we will but call unto thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.